All right, so the way I usually make these videos is uh, I type everything out that I want to say first, and then when I'm recording my voice, I just uh, read what I typed. That way I don't stutter or forget anything. But this time after I typed everything out, I realized it's 11 pages long, single-spaced. So it's going to be a really long video, and actually now that I'm done making everything, it's uh, 42 minutes long. I don't think anybody can sit here for 42 minutes and watch the whole thing in one go. So I'm going to put a lot of timestamps down there uh, in the video descriptions to help you navigate in case you need to come back. Um, so yeah, look for that. Welcome back to Pew Pew Academy. This is lesson three. In this lesson, we'll start talking about PvP. During my streams, a lot of new players will come in and ask me questions like, what's the best class for PvP, or what's the best PvP build? Honestly, it's a little frustrating sometimes to be asked this kind of questions, because there's no straightforward answer to it. PvP in LB Online is a very broad topic, because there were so many different kinds of PvP in here, and every one of them is different from all the other ones. So the answer to that question is going to be different for every mode of PvP, and it's not like there's actually one best build out there for most of these PvP modes. Instead of having one best build, we have a selection of good weapons and equipments that are currently strong, and we pick and choose which ones we want. So because it's such a broad topic, we're going to dissect it into sections, and I'll make a video to talk about each section. In this video, we'll talk only about solo open world PvP. I've mentioned it before in lesson 1 when I was introducing myself that I am a solo player 90% of the time, so this is a area of forte for me. As someone who has done quite a bit of solo PvP in this game, I have to tell you that LB Online is not a game that is made for solo players. There's very little solo PvP content in this game. Most of the times you'll be fighting outnumbered, but that's also the reason why I enjoy solo PvP so much, because when there's so much odds stacked against you, it's extra satisfying when you win. So let's start talking about builds for solo PvP. Solo PvP does not mean 1v1s. In the open world, most of your fights as a solo player will be outnumbered fights, and a lot of builds that are good for 1v1s are not actually going to be good for the open world. In the open world, you need to build for 1vx situations. Now, like I said earlier, there's really no one best build for this, but there is a formula for making a good build. So instead of showing you a bunch of different builds, I'm just going to give you this formula and talk about what kind of weapons and gear are out there that can give you what you need. And you can pick and choose from those which ones you want to make your own solo PvP build. Every good solo PvP build consists of three key components and two lesser components. The three key components are high mobility, big damage, and some kind of sustain or damage mitigation. The lesser components are CC and purchase. The key components are things that every good solo PvP open world build should have. And the lesser components are things that are nice to have, but you could live without it. In the Art of War, Sun Tzu said, the good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then waited for an opportunity to defeat the enemy. In other words, to win, first you have to not lose. Having high mobility is how we put ourselves beyond the possibility of defeat. Very often in the open world, when you see someone show up on your screen, you think you can take him 1v1. So you jump on him, and then his friend shows up. So you start kiting and thinking, okay, it's 2v1 now, no problem, we can still do this. And then 20 more of their friends show up. And now you have to run. So if you have high mobility in your build, you can just disengage, mount up, and go look for another fight in which the odds are less unfair to you. Of course, having high mobility also means that it will be much harder for your targets to get away from you. In the open world, there are a lot of places to run. So if you want to get that dank loot and not just some emotional victories, then you need the mobility to be able to chase down and finish off your targets. So mobility is both your sword and your shield. Second on the list is high damage. In outnumbered of fights, you'll only have a small window of time to do damage. And then after that, you'll need to run. So your weapon choice needs to be something that can hit hard. 
and preferably something that doesn't have much of a casting time, so you can keep jumping into fights, do some big numbers, run away, and then come back to do it again when you have cooldowns. Finally, we need to have some sustain in our builds. So while we're hitting them with our big damage and kiting them with our high mobility, we can also heal back whatever return damage that we take during the process, and that way we keep this going. Because if we're outnumbered, then that means we need to go through a lot more HP bars than they do in order to win the fight. So we need something to keep our HP bars full. That way we can outlast our enemies. Now let's look at some specific weapon and gear choices that can help us achieve what we need. First, we have established that we need mobility in the open world. So from weapons, we'll eliminate any weapon that has no mobility at all. So no crossbows, no druid or holy staffs, no curse weapons, and no fire staffs. Next, we need something that can actually do damage. So even though maces have some mobility skills, especially the one-handed maze, which has two dashes, they just don't do enough damage to have the kind of impact that we want. So probably no maces, and most hammers are no good either. But there are some exceptions, and we'll talk about those in a bit. And no arcane staffs. So for sustain, out of the weapons that are left, there's only one weapon I can think of that can actually heal you, and that's the one-handed axe. But the one-handed axe has fairly low damage, so I wouldn't really recommend it either. For sustain, we'll get most of our sustain from our armor choices and the potions. So out of the weapons that are left, the ones that are really worth looking at are in the source tree, dual source and carving source. These weapons have pretty similar play styles and impacts. They both have a non-targeted dash on their E, so unlike the claymore or the broadsword, they can use their E's to dash both into and out of fights. And both of these are very high damage weapons. The Q stack on the sword also increase your attack and movement speed. So when you're using a sword, a lot of the times, the mobility that you get from your Q stacks and your E are all you need to, to chase someone down. So you could save your boot skill for running away if you need to. The W choice on the sword have a lot of skills that look promising, but at the moment, the best one by far is Parry Strike. Parry Strike is a super strong skill right now. It makes you immune to all CC and damage for 0.8 seconds, and during that time, any damage you take is reflected back at the enemy instead. At the end of the 0.8 seconds, you will perform an AoE attack that does damage and silences everyone around you. So this is a very high utility skill that really rewards you for having good timing and good reflexes. Because you can block some very big skills like Curse Staff E or Groove Keeper Stuns, and you can reflect some big damage skills like Dagger Pair E with it. So if you can time it right, you will really get a lot of value out of that skill. But this is a skill that is unlocked at mastery level 70. So if you don't have it yet, Iron Will and Splitting Smash are both good choices too for your W. Especially Iron Will, which gives you another mobility skill and damage mitigation. So two of those two components in one skill. And it counters Purchase. So it lets you keep those Q stacks that you need for doing big damage, as well as important survival skills like Hellion Jacket, for example. Also, keep in mind that there are some rumors about nerfs and buffs coming to the swords. So Parry Strike is looking to get another nerf in the next patch that will increase its cooldown by 5 seconds and remove the silence at the end. And Iron Will is going to get a buff that grants you an extra heroic stack when you activate the skill. So these two skills might switch places in terms of power once the new patch hits. But we'll have to wait until that patch comes out to see. In the Hammer Tree, there's the Tomb Hammer. All the other hammers are going to be fairly low on damage. They are made to be tank weapons, but the Tomb Hammer is a very high consistent damage weapon. The E makes your auto attacks do a lot of damage, and there's also a ton of soft CC in the form of slows from both from actually all three of your weapon skills. The E also gives you a huge resistance buff, so you get a lot of damage mitigation from it too. If you want to run Tomb Hammers in the solo PvP build, make sure you use 
the slowing charge on your W is a great mobility skill that also slows all enemies that you collide with during the dash. And make sure you use the assassin hood in your head slot, because the E on the tomb hammer is such an important and powerful skill. Running the assassin hood allows you to use two E's back to back. And you can use it to refresh the cooldowns on your W and your boot skills too for some extra mobility when you need it. We'll give an honorable mention here to the Groove Keeper. The Groove Keeper is not really a good solo weapon, but some of you might have heard of the Pog Lock build, which is a build made by Lupak to counter group gankers. I'll put a link in the video descriptions below to Lupak's video showcasing this build, but keep in mind that while it looks amazing in the video, it's really just a gimmick for clapping some very bad gankers, and it doesn't actually work well in solo play against people who are actually running good builds and know how to play the game. In the bow tree, the best solo weapon from there by far is the war bow. The regular bow and the baton bow gets an honorable mention too, but the war bow is the one that really shines in open world solo PvP. A lot of my older videos are on the war bow. So if you want to check those out, just click on my channel and look for some of those older videos. There are two good W choices on the Warbow, Frost Shot and Ray of Light. Ray of Light is great in situations like solo dungeon dives, where the chances of you running into a Zerg is fairly small. It gives you a lot more damage than the other option, and the snare on it helps you keep your distance, so it helps your kiting even when you don't have much mobility in the rest of your guild. But in open world situations where every 1v1 could quickly turn into a 1v5, Frost Shot provides you with some extra safety. There are a lot of armor and gear choices that are good for the Warbow. In my videos, I like using the Guardian Helmet, Cultist Robe, and Scholar Sandals, but there are many many more options, so don't feel like you're limited to those. In the Dagger Tree, we need to spend a little extra time on this one because almost every single dagger is usable in open world solo PvP. The only ones I don't like are the regular one-handed dagger and the claws. Now, I know a lot of you have probably seen a whole lot of claws out there in the open world, but most of these players are probably group gankers. And in group ganking, claws have a easy to land stun that last quite a while and do a good chunk of damage. So people like it because it's simple and it gets the job done. And when you have a whole big gang group dogpiling one player, a lot of times landing that E is all you need to do before looting really fast. But in solo play, the Claw E have way too big of a cooldown for a single target channeled skill that can easily be interrupted. And you have other options in the dagger tree with the dagger pair, death givers, black hands. All of these weapons have powerful E skills that have much shorter cooldowns than the claw. And you have the blood letter, which has one of the highest mobilities in the game because of the two dashes. And the executability on the E, which can finish a squishy target off the moment they fall below the threshold, which makes it very dangerous to play against. Also note that when you hit a target below the threshold with your blood letter E, all of your skills will come off cooldowns 10 seconds faster. This allows you to really burn some cooldowns and push hard for that kill, and the moment you get it, your escape skills will be back from the 10 second cooldown reduction, and you'll be able to dash right back out to safety. Death Givers and Dagger Pairs are very similar weapons, and for the most part, you can Think of them at, you can think of the dagger pair as a cheaper option of the death givers. You can play both of these weapons in one of two, way, two ways, as a bruiser or as a sneaky assassin. In the open world, it's much more common to see them played as assassins, and there are several ways in which you can build them, but the most common one is perma stealth build with assassin jacket and hellion shoes. If you want to see these builds in action, I'll provide some links in the video descriptions below to other YouTube channels that have a lot more gameplay footages of these builds. I should point out here that with these Prima Stealth Dagger builds, you'll see that there is no sustain at all in any of the weapon or equipment choices, and that's because you have so much damage mitigation, you can avoid so much damage by being in stealth all the time that a healing potion may be the only heal that you ever need. It's also worth mentioning here that uh, Death Givers and 
dagger pairs are some of the best weapons for one-shotting people if you run them with a druid rope. Because Assassin Spirit on the queue is a toggle skill that has zero cooldown. So you can spam it to get stacks on the druid robe. And the combined damage buffs from a fully stacked druid robe, royal hood, assassin spirit, and hellion shoes makes it so that you can blow up pretty much any target in one super fast combo. Now personally, I don't think this is worth anything in solo play because you're putting all your marbles in one bag by building for nothing but damage. So in an L-numbered fight, you might be able to take someone with you, but you're almost guaranteed to die right afterwards. So outside of arenas, I don't think there's any good use for this. In the spear tree, we have my favorite weapon at the moment, which is the one-handed spear. This is the highest mobility weapon in the game. There are other weapons which have multiple movement skills, but if you put all of these weapons on a racetrack, the one-handed spear will win because the one-handed spear E is a fairly short cooldown the dash skill and the inner focus skill on the W gives a whopping 80% movement speed that stacks with your boots if you get the full channel. That means you can easily outrun galloping dire wolves when you have the buff on. The E on the one-handed spear also does some pretty solid damage, and it's pretty easy to get it to max stacks because your Q, Lunging Strike, gives you a stack for each target that you hit with it. So in outnumbered fights, you can stack up your Q much faster than if you're using a dual sword, for example. And the knockup on the E also gives you a short CC that is very useful for interrupting powerful channel abilities like Levitate on the Cold Destroyer or Dead Climax on the Bowcasters. It's also worth noting here that the Inner Focus skill gives you both a damage buff and a movement speed buff. And the damage buff is applied to things like Hellion Jacket and Stalker Jacket as well. This is especially powerful with Hellion Jacket because Hellion Jacket heals you for the amount of damage that you deal with it. So having that 40% extra damage buff from Inner Focus means your Hellion Jacket will also heal you for 40% more as well. We'll give another honorable mention here to the one-shot pike build. This is something that a lot of you probably have seen by now. And if you are ever on the receiving end of this, you'll know that it's something not very pleasant to play against. A typical one-shot pike build will be pike, druid robe, demon cape, demon helm, soldier boots, or hunter shoes. The way you use this build is very similar to the one-shot dagger build that I mentioned earlier. But the key here is to snare the enemy inside your demon cave with your pike E, and with all the damage buffs on you from inner focus and druid robe, the demon cave and a few auto attacks will be enough to kill your target before the silence from your demon helmet and the snare from your E ends. I personally don't think this is a great build for solo PvP in the open world because it's too gimmicky. Demon Cave has a long cooldown, and there are no sustain skills in your build. So a lot of the times when I play against this build with my regular Spear build, I could use the delay between the Demon Helmet Silence and the auto attack to my advantage, and use my Scholar Sandals to avoid getting snared by the Rooting Smash on the Pike. This allows me to move off of the Demon Cave puddle so I don't get one-shotted. Then, when the silence ends, I could just heal back to full health with Levitate on the Cultist Robe, or if I'm going cheap and running something other than Cultist Robe, I can heal up with Guardian Helmet and Healing Potions. And then I will win the fight afterwards, because I will have much more sustained damage than the Pike player who just blew his load. Another common way for the Pike build to get countered is with Ice Block on the Cleric Cow. More people are using that skill now, because you can use it while you're getting CC'd. So if you get silenced by the pie player, you can just press Ice Block and you'll survive their burst and they will have to wait a whole minute before they can try again. That's plenty of your time for you to chase them down and kill them if you have the mobility for it, or to just ignore them and walk away if you don't. So if I was to play the pike myself, I will modify the build a little bit to allow some sustain in it. In this clip, I'm going with the cultist robe instead of the druid, and a royal hood instead of the demon helm. So I moved the damage buff from the robe to the head slot. 
and that allows me to put a super strong sustain skill in it. I will no longer be able to truly one shot people because without the silence from the demon helm, people can use their defensive skills now to tank my burst. But that's fine because I. Won't be completely useless after my burst. Now that I can afford to trade more auto attacks and stay in the fight longer, because I know I can just heal up afterwards and try again. And with rooting smash on a fairly short cooldown, we can just keep doing this over and over until I win. Again, the idea is to not put everything in one burst and have nothing afterwards to keep going with. In the quarter staff tree, there are two weapons that are really worth mentioning. The regular quarter staff and the double bladed staff. Soul Scythe also gets an honorable mention here. It's it was one of the most popular quarter staffs, and it's still used very often in ZVZs. But after some nerfs to its CC duration, it's no longer the best for solo PVP, and the regular quarter staff has taken its place. The double bladed staff is one of the super high mobility weapons, but for solo PVP, I don't think it really has enough damage. But it's most often used by group gankers as a tagger or a dismounter. The regular quarter staff can pull off some nice bursts when you use it in combination with a demon cape and a stalker jacket. Quarter staff E is one of the longest immobilizing effects in the game, so it works really well with a demon cape, similar to the pike we mentioned earlier. Also, it's worth noting that the quarter staff E is called the separator because it roots the person that you hit with it, and it knocks away all the enemy players around that target. So, in an outnumbered fight, if you want to snare someone to drop some burst on him, while you do that, you'll also be knocking away all of his teammates. So, it's a nice little extra utility for outnumbered fights. In the frost tree, the one-handed frost and the permafrost prism are both viable options as well. Frost is the only mage tree that has a good mobility skill. Frost Nova on the W gives you a teleport and CCs people near your original location. Frost is a very high consistent damage weapon. Personally, I don't think it's got enough mobility for the open world, especially. Uh, considering that all of your frost damage is in the Q spams, which requires to stand still and spam spells, so in general, I think frost really shines when you have say, some teammates that can help you CC people while you spam Qs at them. But I have seen some people do some great things in solo situations with the frost, so I'll throw it in here for you to consider. One-handed frost and permafrost prison are the only two that I mentioned because I think they have the best E skills. The great frost also has some nice potential because of the high damage and low cooldown on the E, but the other two just look stronger to me because of the CC on their E's. Also, it's important to note that the one-handed frost, being a one-handed weapon, allows you to access an offhand. There are several good offhand weapons that can work really well with the frost. Leering Cane is very often used by players in group ganking because the increased CC duration really helps you catch people that are trying to run away. Moist Sack gives you some increased damage, which is really nice because the one-handed frost has a low base IP, so it doesn't hit as hard as,、uh, say, the Permafrost Prism with its Q spams, and the Moist Sack can help you solve that problem. But my favorite offhand. For the one-handed frost is the Tome of Spells, which gives you mana and a cast time reduction. Like I said earlier, the frost needs to be able to stand still and spam spells to do damage. So a lot of players will run it with things like Mage Robe and Morgana Capes for that cast for that increased casting speed. And the Tome of Spells on top of that really helps you pump out those ice shards. You might have noticed that I skipped over axes. Now, personally, I don't think axes are good for solo PVP right now、uh, because they just don't have as much utility as the other choices. They are very all-in and one-directional weapons, which makes them very easy to outplay. The bear paws are very hard-hitting weapons, but 
A good portion of the bear paw's damage comes from the E, which has a huge 30 second cooldown, and a good portion of the damage in that skill comes from bleeding, which is easily preventable with Guardian Helmets. And Guardian Helmets are one of the most popular options right now for the head slot. So that indirectly makes the bear paw very weak in solo play. Some Axe players might disagree with me on this, but the fact is I have not died to any kind of an Axe build in the open world in 1v1s or 1v2s ever since they nerfed the Great Axe dismount build, and that was months ago. That said, if you still want to give the Axe a try, they do have some nice mobility skills with Adrenaline Boost on the W, the Leap on the Bear Paws, and the Movement Speed buff on the Great Axe. Since they do have a lot of bleeds or skills that hit you multiple times. They could work pretty well with the Mercenary Jacket as well, which is a very nice and cheap option if you want to put some sustain into your build. Next, let's talk about gear. I said earlier that you'll be getting most of your sustain from your armor and helmet skills, so let's bring those to the forefront. Guardian Helmet right now is one of the most popular options in the head slot for solo players because it's the only helmet that gives you a self heal. It's not a huge heal, but it's on a fairly short cooldown, so you can use it multiple times in a fight, and it removes all damage over time effects on you except for poison potions. This lets you prevent a lot of damage from things like curse staffs and bear paws, and even light crossbow E's which is also part of the reason why I think those weapons are not very good right now for solo play, because if your hardest hitting skills can be countered by such a popular item, then you're probably going to have a hard time getting good kills with it. Also keep in mind that the Guardian Helmet affects you and up to four allies in a small area, so you can use it to save teammates in group PvP too. Most of the viable self-heal skills are in the chest slot. We have the Cultist Robe, which gives you probably the biggest self-heal in the game, and it gives you immunity to physical damage while channeling, and fills up your mana bar by a good bit too. The biggest problem, of course, is that it's e easily interruptible, and you're not immune to magical damage while you're channeling. So you do want to pick a good timing to use this skill, because if you're low HP and your biggest healing skill gets interrupted, then you're pretty much screwed. We also have the Hellion Jacket, which gives you a life-stealing aura that does damage in a big AoE around you and heals you for the amount of damage dealt. This is a super strong sustain skill for bruisers, especially in outnumbered situations, because when you are hitting multiple targets with it, you are healing off of every single one of them. It also works together with damage buff skills like Inner Focus on the Spear, Raging Blaze and Adrenaline Boost on the Axis, and armor debuffs like Fearless Strike on the Carving Swords. Lastly, we have the Mercenary Jacket, which is the cheapest one of the three chest options that gives you sustain. The Blood skill on the Mercenary Jacket gives you a buff that heals you for a small amount of health each time you inflict damage on an enemy. This includes damage over time effects, like the Bleeds from Axes or the Burns from Fire Staffs, as well as skills that hit you multiple times, like the Claw E and a Great Axe E. There's a limit on this buff of either 8 seconds or 15 hits, whichever comes first. So in order to take full advantage of this buff, you need a weapon that can land a lot of hits within a short time. Some possible options include claws, regular bows, axes, curses, fire staffs. Now you might notice that a lot of these weapons are that we're mentioning right now are either ruled out or not recommended in the discussion earlier. So Mercenary Jacket is also not going to be the best recommendation for chess piece because uh, because out of the three chess pieces that we mentioned, it gives you the least amount of healing unless you have the right weapon to go with it, and it has the longest cooldown. There's one more self-healing skill in the armor skills, and that's the Rejuvenating Sprint that is available on all plate boots. But really, this is not a viable skill to use right now, because the amount of heal you get it, you get from it is just too weak to trade an actual run skill from. So unless it gets buffed in the future, we're not going to look at it. In my builds, I really like to overload myself on high sustain. So see me running Guardian Helmet and Cultist Robe on a lot of my streams, for whichever weapon I'm using. This is not really necessary. 
I just like it because I do a lot of dumb things, like charging into a big group of people to see if I could kill one or two, and having an excessive amount of healing really saves my ass when I do this kind of things. But if you're a sane player, you really only need one skill for sustain plus some healing potions, and a lot of the times a guardian helmet is sufficient for that. If you go with the guardian helmet, then this opens up your chest piece to a variety of selections like mage robe, druid robe, cleric robe, scholar robe, assassin jacket, and stalker jacket. So let's talk about the robes first. Scholar robe is only mentioned here because it's probably one of the best options for the frost staff. Outside of that, there's not much use for it in terms of solo PVP. Druid robe is often used for burst builds like the Pike and Deathgiver one-shot builds that we looked at earlier. Cleric robe is often used in group fights as it gives you a invulnerability skill that buys you valuable time during which you can reposition yourself. It is used in solo play too as a survival skill, but when you use it in solo play, remember that it's not just a survival skill. Once the shield is on you, it gives you a 30% damage and healing power buff as well. This can let you pull off some big turn and burn type of plays. And the healing buff on it does apply to your guardian helmet. So if you run those two together, you can get some extra healing power out of the guardian helmet as well. Mage robe is one of the most versatile skills in on the chest slot. The purging shield ability can be used to purge away both damage buffs and defensive buffs. So things like enchanted quiver, explosive arrows, and sword and Q, sword and spear Q stack can all be purged away to mitigate incoming damage. And defensive buffs like Hellion Jacket, Cleric Robe, Mercenary Jacket can all be purged off to help you finish kills. You can also use it to purge enemy run buffs to help you escape when multiple foes are chasing you. In the Jacket Tree, the Assassin Jacket and the Stalker Jacket are both very good options. The Assassin Jacket is used in a lot of builds. The、uh, Ambush skill on it gives you a stealth that you can use to escape with. As well as a damage buff on the next hit when you're coming out of stealth, so it works really well with weapons with big hard hitting skills like war bows and death givers. Stalker jacket is a good option for weapons that have a lot of CC and utility, but not quite enough damage on their own. So it's a good option to consider when you want to play anything from the quarter staff tree. In general. When we're talking about solo play, the best chest options are all in the leather and cloth trees. We don't usually use plate chest piece because that will lower our damage and healing power too much. Yes, I'm aware that there are some solo one v z clap builds like the pog lock build that we mentioned earlier that uses soldier armor, but those are very cheesy builds that. Really, only work well in specific conditions, and they're not good builds for open world solo PVP because in small scale they're just too easy, too easy to read and counter. There's also some builds like the Warbow build with the Knight armor that just kites you forever with constant pokes and a wind wall to knock you away when you get close. But those builds really only work well in Hellgate, where your opponents are trapped in there with you, and you have a lot of time to harass them to death. But in the open world, if your opponents can't kill you, they can just run away from you. And if you're running a build with that low damage, you won't really be able to chase them down and finish them off. So I don't recommend any plate armor for open world solo PVP. If you decide to put your sustain skill on your chest piece, then you'll free up your head slot, and there are a lot of viable options for the head slot. So I'll just name a few that I think really stands out. There's the Coldest Cow, Fiend Cow, Hunter Hood, Stalker Hood, Specter Hood, and Demon Helmet. Again, we'll start with the cloth pieces. In PVP, Coldest Cow puts out a debuff that makes enemy players take damage every time he attacks or uses a skill. This is a great ability for killing players that are using weapons with high attack speed, like regular bow or dual swords. It's also very useful for killing holy healers because every time they try to heal themselves, they'll take some damage and they'll cancel out a good portion of their heals. Sometimes players will be very mindful of the buff that you're put on the of the debuff that you're putting on them, and they'll stop attacking you when you put this debuff on them. So when that happens, then this skill becomes a very good defensive skill because it stops them from attacking. 
FinCal gives you a single target purge. And when we were talking about the purge on the major orb, we went over we went over how the purge skills could be really powerful. The advantage of the fin cow over the major of though is that the fin cow gives you a single target purge. And when we talked about the major of earlier, we went over how the purge skills could be very powerful. The advantage of the fin cow over the major of though is that the fin cow is a target to use skill, so it doesn't require your enemy to hit you. So unless they have a damage over time effect on you, with the major of there's really no way to guarantee the purge, but with the fin cow, you can guarantee the purge. In the leather hoods tree, we have the hunter hood, which is used quite often in solo builds. It gives you a defensive bonus as well as a damage reflection, which can easily turn the tide of a battle. But just be sure that when you're using this skill, you're timing it to reflect as much damage as possible. If you just turn it on randomly, most of the times people will just stop hitting you and wait it out. Also, it may be a fun fact to know that damage reflection do stack. So if you're using a spear with deflecting spin on your W, and you use that after you activate retaliate on your hunter hood, then if your enemy hits you, they'll be taking 180% of the damage that they're doing to you, because deflecting spin reflects 80% of the damage, and retaliate reflects 100% of the damage. Stalker Hood is a great choice for a lot of melee builds to push for kills. It gives you a 20% damage buff, as well as a huge armor reduction on any enemy player around you that are below half health. You see this being used a lot with Death Givers. Once they whittle your HP down to below 50% threshold, they will hit you with the Stalker Hood active, and then they'll just make you explode. Spectre Hood is also an interesting headpiece. Its active refreshes the cooldowns on your chest piece, so whatever skill you're running on your chest, you basically get to use it twice with Spectre Hood. So a lot of people will run this with a sustain on the chest piece just to push their sustain over the top. Lastly, there's the Demon Helmet, which is a super powerful disabling skill. It makes your next auto attack silence your enemy after a short delay for a very long duration. With my current specs in helmets, a tier 6 demon helmet silences up to 6.16 seconds. This is very often used in high burst damage builds like that one shot pike build that we talked about earlier because it can prevent your enemies from activating any defensive skills while you burst them so they have to just sit there and tank it and probably die in the process. Uh, keep in mind also that the Demon Helmet can be used defensively. For example, if you're running Demon Helmet with Cultist Robe, silencing your enemy before you start the channel of Levitate means you're guaranteed to be able to finish the entire channel of Levitate without getting interrupted. Finally, we get to the boot selections. Right now in the open world, there's really only five good skills in the boot selection. Starting with the cloth again, focus run on the scholar sandals is probably the second most popular one right now, which is why it's likely getting nerfed soon. But currently it is my favorite skill in the shoot slot. It gives you a huge run speed buff, covers a lot of ground, regenerates mana for you, and it makes you immune to slow stuns and most snares during its channel. When you're using this skill, keep in mind that because it is a channel skill, it cannot be purged by things like Fincal, but it can be interrupted by displacement skills like Wind Wall, knockoffs like Reckless Charge on the Spear, Silence like the Demon Helmet, and skills that specifically say they interrupt channels like the Clause E or the Baton Bow E. Hunter Shoes is also a good run skill for any build that has a lot of CC in it. The 30% extra CC duration from the Hunter Shoes is really painful if you combine it with something like a Quarter Staff or a Pike. Wanderlust on the Soldier Boots is still used sometimes, but personally I don't like it at all because I think the cooldown is just way too long, and if you get purged while you're trying to run away, then you'll be left without run skill for a very long time, and that's not good. If none of the skills above sound perfect to you, then just use the regular run skill, which is available on all boots. The regular run is probably the most popular boot skill right now in the open world. It covers a lot of ground and has a fairly short cooldown. 
It's available on all boots, shoes, and sandals, so you can use whichever one you have the highest spec in. The last run skill that we'll talk about is, well, it's actually not a run skill, but the last boot skill that we'll talk about is the Hellion shoes. The Hellion shoes are mostly used for the damage buff that it gives you. It puts you in stealth for a few seconds and lets you jump to a target after a short channel. And it gives you a 30% damage buff after the jump. I would only use Hellion shoes in a build that has a lot of mobility or escape skills elsewhere because it's not a reliable escape skill by itself. If you're using Hellion shoes, keep in mind that you can target both allies and enemies. So you can target an ally if you need to escape. But if you're solo, you probably won't have any allies around. So if that's the case, you can still use the Hellion shoes to help you escape by using it as a short stealth skill. The way you do this, you target the enemy and you start the channel by pressing F. And you'll go into stealth when you do this. This will give you a few seconds for you to make some juky movements. And just make sure that you cancel the channel by pressing F again. Because that way you won't be forced to teleport to your target afterwards. So to summarize, we went over the three key components of all good solo builds, which are mobility, damage, and sustain slash damage mitigation. Remember that if there is enough damage mitigation in your build, in the form of CCs, kiting, resistance buffs, stealth, and etc., then maybe the only sustain you need is a healing potion. Then there's two lesser components, which are things that are nice to have, but you can live without it, and those are CC and purchase. Then we went over a whole list of weapons and armor choices that you could use that will give you those components. And if you forgot what those are already, rewind and watch it again, because that was way too long of a list for me to repeat all over again. So that's it for this video. As always, please remember to like, subscribe, and jump into my Twitch if you want any more detailed explanations on anything I mentioned. And if I missed anything, or if there's anything you don't agree with, comment below and we'll talk about it in the discussion video that follows. I'm gonna get so many hateful messages from Axe players now.